Hi everyone, welcome to our second live artist talk at Perez House Gallery. My name is Hector Garza and I'm going to be the moderator for this evening's talk. On behalf of Perez House Gallery, thank you for watching. It is my great pleasure and honor to introduce Gabby Magali. Gabby Magali is an MFA candidate at UTSA and is currently exhibiting her solo thesis show, Yo No Nací Para Aguantar A Nadie, virtually at Presa House Gallery. She is a first generation Mexican American and is the first in her family to go to college. Gabby is a Cami Award winning artist. This award was presented by Blue Star Contemporary and Luminaria. And without further ado, let's begin our artist talk with Gabby Magali. Hi everyone, my name is Gabby Magali. I'm an MFA candidate at UTSA and I'm right now finishing my thesis year um, in grad school. Uh, I was born and raised in Bryan College Station. Um, College Station is really known for Texas A&M University. Do you have any siblings? What was your experience growing up? And when did the first spark of art enter your life? Um, I'm the I'm the oldest uh, daughter out of three. I have a younger sister and a younger brother. My experience my experience growing up was that I had a lot of pressure put on me because I was just, I was a guinea pig and I had to essentially create a blueprint for my younger uh, siblings. Um, growing up, my mom had a really was really big about education. Her highest education was high school, and she just knew that education was the key just to really. <clears throat> Just she wanted us to be educated and just to be uh, to grow beyond high school and stuff. So my mom every day would just be like, you're going to go to college. You're going to go to college. Um, she just didn't understand how to get us into college. She didn't know how to apply for school, how to apply for classes, basketball, any of that. So that I was the one that paved the way to understand how to apply for college to get into FAFSA or to get FAFSA and stuff like that. But I did have a lot of pressure being the oldest, like having to take care of my siblings when my mom couldn't, like when she had to uh, go to work or stay at work and stuff. So I had to care for them more. Uh, my first experience of like creativity, I was just um, growing up. I mean, I think every kid's creative and I was just really creative, like with playing with dolls and um, just creating with whatever, like paper and crayons my mom would give me. Um, but oh, I really um, in art school or art school. Elementary school was when the was the first time that I created um like a purple mask or some sort out of paper mache in art class, and I won a little blue ribbon at George Bush Library, and to me that was like super exciting at the time as a kid. So that was the first time I like I could that you guess I guess you could say I had my first time, my creative exp uh, my creative spark um, was in elementary school. What was it like trying to keep up with your brothers? Um, since I was the oldest girl at the time, I had, I didn't have older brothers. I just had, a, I didn't have older guy, co boy cousins and stuff. I was the first grandchild, first girl grandchild to be born. So I had three older cousins, three older boy cousins. They were hard to uh, keep up with because I wanted to go outside and play with them. And I wanted to get dirty like they did. And I wanted just to run around just like them and stuff. But there were times like, I was told that wasn't lady really like to get dirty. That wasn't lady really like to do this and that. Um, so I was kind of held back a little bit from my um, from my like, family and stuff. But I really wanted to go out and play with the boys and stuff. Um, even in middle school, I was in the same school. We all went to the same middle school, and even then, I tried. I wanted to keep up with them. Like they were already dating and stuff, and I wanted to. At the time, I thought I wanted a boyfriend, but. I wanted to keep up. I was like, I wanted to do that. I wanted to go out and have uh, go to the movies with my friends. So that was very hard because my mom didn't really let me. She didn't trust people, and I don't blame her. Like now, I understand why. Because I mean, having a girl, we are more. I guess you could say, more things can happen to us. Um, but um, I wanted to go out and be with them all the time, and it just they were there was moments where I just couldn't be with them. So I was. They were very competitive, and I wanted to be just like them. So that was hard to try to keep up with the boys whenever I was being held back on certain things in life. In middle school, many kids have a wide variety of electives to choose from, but you set your sights on woodshop class. What was that experience like for you?
So in middle school, I decided to pick a uh, wood shop. Um, once again, because I wanted to keep up with my guy cousins, I wanted to do um, a more masculine or more more manly thing, a manly elective. In my head, I thought that was very manly, but now I know it's pretty cool um, to like, anybody could use tools, but growing up, I always saw the men use the tools. So I wanted to, to, to learn how to use a drill, a table saw, a weld. I wanted to learn how to do all that stuff. So I learned how to use, I learned how to use it. Can you just imagine a group of like, I guess like, I think it was like 20 of us, like 11, 12 year olds being taught how to use a table saw. Like that to me is crazy. I thought I was so grown at that time, but I learned how to, I learned how to build a clock, um, a porch swing and what else did I learn? I learned a couple little things here and there, but it was really fun to learn tools and like to work with my hands more. And I did do it a lot in, um, I did have an art elective a previous, uh, I think it was sixth grade, but to work with tools and actually create an actual like um, object, a 3D object was so much fun. If you attended school for art or other fields of study, what year did you begin your studies? And what was your experience like throughout this time in school, university or art school? I graduated um, high school in May of twenty uh, May of twenty twelve, and I went to an early college high school. So when I graduated uh, high school, I was I could a sophomore or junior already because I went to an early college high school. So going into Sam Houston, I started in August 20, 2012. I started right away because I didn't want to lose the momentum that I had, like or the motivation and stuff. Um, going to uh going to Sam Houston State University uh, as an artist or for art or for an art degree, it was a shock because I was out on my own. I didn't have anybody to tell me when I had to come home or or when I had to leave the house or anything like that. That that freedom was very weird and very liberating, but it just was um so I had to like discipline myself when I had to like when to eat, when to sleep, when to like work on stuff. That was all new to me. And then going from a, a high school where they taught English, science, and math and all that stuff, and only taking one art class a semester to taking four to five studio art classes, that was very, very, um, a huge transition mm -hmm. into the art world because I, I wasn't used to so many art classes and that really threw me off and it, it just took a lot of discipline to learn or um it just took a lot of discipline how uh, to learn how to creatively put and give focus to 100 percent of each of my assignments and stuff that was probably the hardest and i really did enjoy sam houston i did like the fact that um every day there was something different and something new it was very tiny. Um, we did have to go um, to Houston, which was about an hour away from Huntsville. We would drive an hour to Houston every Friday to go check out art um, with Freud's Museum and Pro Museum Studies and Practices. I can't remember the name of the class, but we would go almost every Friday to go check out um, openings in Houston, which was really fun because that was really the first time I actually got to taste any kind of sense of art, like art art museums and art galleries and actually see the new, the contemporary world and stuff because um, Brian Call Station doesn't have any art at all. And if it does, it's something very tiny. It's like little blue bonnet paintings. There's nothing, nothing that is, that I do consider art, but conceptually that wasn't what, what art school was being, was what we were being taught in art school was concept. And that was a very, a whole new world to me besides assignments. And it was now learning how to put concept and meaning behind these assignments, which was very um, challenging, but I quickly understood what it meant and that the work would be stronger with concepts behind, uh, behind them. Who were some of your mentors who guided you along the way? Some of the people that, some of my mentors along the way, it has to be obviously um, my professor, Ms. Hex, the one that got me into art to begin with. She's the one that told me that in high school, She's the one that told me that I could go to art school and that blew my mind at the time because I didn't even know you could even go to school to be an artist. Um, I always thought that you only went to school to be a doctor, a lawyer, an English teacher or any of that. So when she told me that, that really blew my mind and she helped me 
essentially figure out what art schools to go to she's the one that gave me like uh brochures and she's the one that told me like look there's this school there's this school there's this school you could do go to school for this this and this and this like this discipline and there's sculpture drawing photography and all of that and i really uh, got hooked on photography at the time so i started looking into programs like obviously in houston i got into that program and then that was that was in high school i was in the text but in in undergrad was becky she's the one She's a tough cookie, and I really love. I really loved how, I really loved pretty much how, she pulled concept out of me and all that stuff because I just thought just to take a picture was just to take a picture and there you go, while well, well, the world can see it. But that's that wasn't it. She was like, you need to know what you put onto the world. There's many different meanings, and what you want to put out is your voice essentially through photography, and and that right there was something that that really changed everything because she guided me into understanding what concept was and like really pulled that out of me and really she was hard on on me but in a really in a good loving way and i don't know if she knows that but she 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 was very intimidating but in a good way and i and i knew she meant well at the end of the day i knew she wanted the best out of all of her students and stuff so that was something that was very um challenging to begin with because i was like oh my goodness she's not gonna like this work she's gonna hate it and blah 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 blah. but she was very she was always giving us very well constructed criticism and stuff and that was what i needed was someone to tell me this is working and this isn't working and stuff and i think that's really hard to come by teachers that honestly love the work that you're that you're doing but they want to challenge you and they really want you to grow as an artist and then she saw something that she said she was like, um, you need to go to grad school. And then she taught, then she, there was this one class um, called professional practices of, of art or business, something like that, as what you take in the last semester of Sam Houston, right when you're about to graduate. And she taught us how to apply for grad school, apply for grants, apply for a school, uh, um, how to apply for art openings, art callings, and... Um, essentially what to do after after graduating um, school. So she helped me out. So being in that class helped me figure out what I wanted to do. And I was like, I want to go to grad school to push myself and to grow a lot more. And that's undergrad. She was a big mentor, big mentor of mine in undergrad. And in grad school, I had Libby. Libby's a great professor at, at UTSA. I call her my art mom because she's also, I feel like, um, Becky like passed the long, passed me along to Libby and I grew even more and stuff. So these past three years, she's been helping, she's been guiding me, she's been mentoring me, um, really, really pushing me and my artwork and stuff. She's really challenged me, really think differently and stuff. So that's been amazing to see how much I've grown with her. Um, so at the end of the day, those are my three top mentors in the art world that have really challenged me. Were your parents supportive of your decision to pursue a degree in art? And did you have a minor? My mom has always been supportive. Everything I've done, everything I've, um, every decision I've made, she's been very supportive. Um, she's been there when I've gotten into, I've gotten into gallery shows or I've gotten accepted into certain things in the art world. And she's been there when I haven't been accepted into things. So she's been there, my rock from day one and stuff. Um, she's just, Anything I want to do with art and I'm like, hey, mom, I really want to use you for a model or I really want to use you for this or my art piece. She's like, okay, just tell me what to do. She never really understands it until the very end. I tried explaining to her, I was like, hey, I need you to do this, this, and this. And she just was like, she just kind of shakes her head and she doesn't understand what it is that I'm telling her. But she just goes along and I just direct her. I'm like, mom, I need you to sit like this or I need you to look like this. I need you to do that. She's like, okay. And I've, uh, she, we've, we've done a lot of art, art projects together. Some of them have failed really bad to where those some of them were not going to see the light of day but there's some here and there that have become that have been successful and stuff so that it does excite me when she does get excited about being um being in my work she's always joke she goes i'm gonna be the next model and stuff so it's really fun to have her there to support me and stuff um when it comes to my dad he hasn't been supportive at all when it comes to this my dad was a um he was absent in my life like even though he was there he was never emotionally there as a father um so that was very hard i remember one thing right before i went to um grad school when i was even thinking about going to grad school and this weird um limbo that that i took a break between undergrad and grad school i took a year and a half off 
um, I was talking to my mom. I was like, Mom, I want to go back to grad school. I want to go back to school. I really want to um, just push my education some more. And she obviously was very supportive. She goes, okay, Mika, just go and do it. Whatever you want to do, just tell me what you want to do, and I'll be there to help you. Or I'll be there to also try to guide you as much as I can or with the knowledge that I have. But my dad wasn't. He was very like, don't even go back to school. Don't waste your time. Don't just don't waste your money. Mexicanos don't care about education. Um, so that was very hard to hear him tell me um, that he essentially just said he didn't care that I got education or not. So he hasn't been supportive at all. And I try not to, uh, I try not to reminisce on those things and stuff. So the only person I really want to like focus on is my mom and making her proud and stuff. So yeah. And then my mom also, when I was in, when I was in the undergrad, I had to this, um, I had a chance to do a minor and I decided to do a minor in business. And my mom was like, go ahead and do a minor in business because just in case photography doesn't happen or something, something goes wrong. I have a minor in business and that that could essentially help me put a foot in the door in the business world if something does happen. And if you do want to end up running your own photography business, you already know how to do accounting and how to do all that stuff, like a little bit. So I do have a minor in business. I haven't really used it and stuff, but it's education that I have. Please describe your transition from undergrad to graduate school. Like I said, I took a break between undergrad and grad school because I was so burnt out with going to college and high school and then going right into high school to undergrad. That was challenging, obviously learning all that in a whole new world. And then I took a break. I went and I um, essentially became a manager at Starbucks and then being there for a year and a half. I figured, I realized that this is not what I wanted to do. I really wanted to go back to school because in that year and a half, I didn't create art at all. I created like one to two images. And even then it wasn't something I was like super duper proud of. So I, um, I put, I pretty much me puse las pilas and I went back to school and I started applying and stuff. And then grad school was a whole, it's just a whole new world because I, Coming from Bryan, from, I mean, we're well populated. We're, we're, we're an okay sized town, but going from Bryan to San Antonio and that uh, when I'm used to only having like two, three HEBs in Bryan and Costa to combine, here we have three HEBs on the same street. That to me was like, holy smokes, this is a huge town, a huge city. Um, so, but going to grad school was weird because it's all on you. It's all self-discipline. Like you create when you are create being creative, you create at your own pace and you set your own deadlines. And that was very hard because I was obviously undergrad. Everything's assignment based. Everything has a deadline. Everything has like, oh, I need ten minutes. I need ten images by in three weeks. Here, it's you create at your own pace, and that to me was very hard for me to transition from assignments to not having assignments and reading, um, finding materials to research on your own versus uh, pro professors did give me assignments, uh, not assignments, I'm sorry, professors did give me um, reading reading uh, articles and stuff, but it was mine. Um, I had to go and find the materials that needed to pretty much fuel my creativity as in I needed to research more about the machismoism and about the marianismoism and about our culture and the Chicano art movement, like I had to go and research that on my own because we were learning other stuff in the art uh, in art history. So that was very hard to transition. And even then, like my mind was still on, I have to work 40 hours a week. I had to be a full-time uh, employee. I had to be a full-time student. And somewhere in there, I had to find a social life. But I stressed, my, I stressed myself out so much that I gave myself shingles in the first semester. So that was an an awful transition was probably the worst first semester and then but the second semester I really I figured I figured out my footing I figured out how to discipline how to when to go to the studio from this time to this time I need to wake work okay from this time to this time I need to read so that was the hardest part but I figured it out in the second semester and stuff but that's where I learned where to make a lot of the work that I'm making now what has been the most challenging point in your art career for me, the most challenging part uh, in my art career probably has to be that in my personal life, I've 
been very um I've been very uh I'm very angry and I'm very bitter in my personal life and that affected my art my art life um my creativity making and stuff so having a, an absent father in my life I that drug and that really affected that side because I started making work um that was very angry and very like fuck essentially everything my dad has ever done to me and I was finally able to um start slowly slowly un uh how can I say this my art making helped me slowly start to express myself and obviously the first steps of uh obviously coming out of a very uh toxic relationship with that was being so angry at him so i started creating just really m mean and bitter things so that's been the hardest part and the fact that even though i do i i feel like i have imposter syndrome and that and, and in my my sometimes in my sound crazy but sometimes i have a little voice in my head and it sounds like my dad telling me that your work isn't 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 worth it um that your work isn't strong enough that no one really cares about what you have to say so that's been the very challenging part and trying to like essentially find a healthy balance between my personal life and my artist life and my creative side and how do i create and that i don't fall and tumble into that dark depression that i was or not depression but that really dark bitter angriness that i was so that's been the hardest part um creatively make it into my art what has been the most rewarding point in your art career? For me, the most rewarding part, I guess going back to the challenging part is that even though I do have this imposter, I, I have this imposter syndrome and like I have that little voice in my head, it's been nice to shut it up um, with a lot of things that are happening, a lot of um, successful things that are coming my, that have been happening, um, like me having to talk about my work at a, at the SP, SPE conference. And that was my very first time talking about my work uh, personally um, in front of a big old crowd of people and then for them to accept my work and then for them to understand that when I talked about the fact that my dad was an alcoholic and that some people started crying and started telling me that they totally understand where I'm coming from and that they also felt the pain that I, I was talking about and that they understood where I'm coming from, that's been very rewarding when I have people understand where where i'm coming from and then i'm making artwork that people just get it like they understand it right away and that i'm not alone in the work that i'm making that there's other people that unfortunately that have felt this way but i'm happy when i i do feel very rewarded when people do can connect to my work that to me is more really rewarding at the end of the day describe any memorable moments when you won an award or gain recognition for your art. I just recently won two camis um, from the con from Contemporary Art Month. I was awarded them from uh, Blue Star Contemporary and Luminaria. I was overjoyed because ever since I found out back in 2017 when I came out here in San Antonio, right when I found out what um, camis were, I was like, "How do I get one? I want one so bad!" And then I started looking at the pretty much the artists that were winning and how amazing their work was. And I was like, okay, I have to, I have to be at that level. Um, hopefully one year I can, I can essentially just be at their level and be even looked at. So when I found out was that Rigo texted me the day that they were gonna start announcing everything. And I was already on Instagram looking if they've announced anything. Rigo was the one that messaged me. He's like, hey, just so you know, you went to Cammy's. And I, I think I texted back right, right back. I was like, what? how what i question mark question mark like because i didn't even i didn't hear anything and then i yelled at i was like my boyfriend was in the living room or in the dining room area and i yelled i was like i just want two camis and i started crying from tears of joy because it it was just crazy and surreal because a lot of um obviously with everything that's happening with the crisis and stuff it was it was fun. It was some good news that I needed after how hard everything has been and how stressful. So that was exciting and very surreal and like amazing. So that's been really cool to win two camis. In talking with you, you mentioned that you have experienced imposter syndrome. 
Can you describe how this affects you and how do you keep it in check? So um, the imposter syndrome has really, at the beginning of grad school, um, it was very hard to control because obviously coming in, I was I was fresh. I felt like I was fresh um, into the game of art again because I was I remember really I have a really bad I have a really bad problem where I compare my um, where I'm at in my art career to other people, which is really really bad. Um, it's very negative on a person on me because it didn't help me. It it wasn't helping me grow at all. It was not at all. I was just comparing, sitting there comparing myself. And these people that I was comparing myself to were obviously the third year people of grad school. And the thing about UTSA's grad program, I love it so much because we're a big community and we all help each other out. We're all very supportive about each other. We all go out and we help uh, go at each other's openings. We always tell each other like, hey, there's this one opening. I thought about your work. You should apply to this one. So when I went in, I was doing, I was comparing myself to them, but they never once were competitive. They were never once like, oh, look at me, I'm big and bad. They never ever showed any of that kind of energy towards me. And they helped me, they helped guide me. Um, they gave me a really great feedback. So I tried very hard to switch that off. Um, but I, I every, it's human, it's a human thing to compare yourself where you're at uh, towards other, other people. And I, like I said, that imposter syndrome is still there. Even when I was in school, like I felt very confident about my work all the way up until I was installing my show. It really kicked into like overdrive. Like right when I was finally putting things here and there and I was like, oh, that looks good over here, over there. That voice kicked in and was like, this work is dumb. This work is stupid. Why are you showing the world work? This is your work isn't even worth showing. That really hit me hard. And I was like, there was one point during that week because I had many meltdowns because everything wasn't going the way I wanted it. Um, I just wanted to just text Rico, like, you know what? We can just cancel the show. We don't have to do this anymore. It's fine. Just take it down. No one's gonna, no one's gonna come see it. No one cares about it. Um, that was very hard. But once I did see it, and once I did, was able to sit with my work and actually take everything in and realize that yes, my books and my my work's an open diary. Um, and I'm I'm very vulnerable. I'm the work I'm showing is very vulnerable. Uh, a very vulnerable side of myself that I've never shown. So that is when I was able to switch that voice off just for a couple of minutes. Um, and that was very satisfying. At what point did your focus from addressing issues of toxic masculinity shift to other subjects? Well, I had a conversation with my teacher, Scott, sometime last year about my work because like I said earlier that my work was coming off very bitter and angry and very like fuck you too much he's and stuff and that he just had a he just we just had a he essentially just told me he goes now that we know the negative side of machismo which is you being upset and being angry what can you do can you like try to make work now that is positive and the fact that you came out of this as a strong um independent um doesn't take shit from anybody um woman so now that you've become a stronger woman out of this can you make try to challenge yourself to make work from that point of view versus just being so angry towards the world and that that shifted immediately when he told me that when he told me that that com like when he told me that uh statement that really shifted everything because he was right. I didn't want to continue putting more negative and more bitterness because I felt like the machismo side was pretty much having control over that and like having control of that art art making. And I didn't want that. I didn't want them to have control over that anymore. And I wanted to essentially make work that was positive to put out into the world. And that the fact that I would never, I'm never going to let them control me anymore. And this is what happened. This is the outcome of them not controlling me anymore. So that's when everything just shifted. And everything you see now in the show is essentially stuff that I try to make positive and stuff that you don't have to continue. Ha you like that the machismoism doesn't have to continue controlling this, and that I now feel healthier and I now feel much more happier and more relief with the work that I ha did put out because a lot of the work that I was making was emotionally draining on me, and that I had to essentially put myself in that negative space every single time I did make a new piece because. I had to remember those evil or the um, that negative feelings um, and 
since you tried it, well, how can I make this into a positive? So I'm glad that me and Scott did have that conversation about now let's turn this into a positive versus a negative. What draws you to this particular subject in your process of art making? How do you form an idea? When I start making my art, um, I write everything down. I have a journal or a sketch pad, you could say, and that I just essentially sit, I lock myself in my studio, I listen to music, and I try to reminisce, uh, or I try to essentially go back and revisit those really awful um, arguments that I had with my father. And I write everything down that I wish I could have told him then and how I feel now. So I start to write a lot of these things down and I continue writing and writing and writing. And I'm just like, I sit in this puddle of like negative thoughts for, um, for I, up to a couple hours, just sit, 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 and just write, write, write. And then I have to essentially, once I'm done, I have to give myself an emotional break and just like back away from my um, writing in my journal or my sketch pad. I sit, I just close it and I sit just close it and just essentially try to like, all right, let me decompress and I'll come back and I'll, just, I'll try to think about ideas when I um essentially over the course of a couple of days. Um, so then I'll just start thinking of things and I'll come back to my book and I start to reread a lot of the things that I wrote. And obviously a lot of it's like, damn, I was really angry and I was really bitter and I was really negative towards the world and stuff. Um, but there's sometimes there's some things that do stick out to me. And I like start highlighting and I'm like, oh, that, that sounds good. Okay, well, how can I turn this into art? Or how can I turn this into an object and stuff like that? So that's how I start my creative processes. processes. Um, there has been times where I'll be driving and I'll just listen to music and my brain just wanders off. And then I immediately start, um, my brain just like, you could do this. And then I start and I like drive when I'm driving, wherever I'm driving to, I like right when I park, I'm like, try to find a piece of paper and I try to write down what it was my idea and stuff. So that's how my quinceanera dress came about because I had asked my mom to bring it to me a couple years ago and it sat in my studio in a trash bag underneath my desk for like two years and I didn't know what to do with it. And then finally when I was writing and writing and writing, I just let that let that um, that passage sit there and then I was driving to my studio a, like many weeks later and then I realized I know what I could do with my quinceanera dress. I can embroider exactly how I felt when I wore that dress and when I made that promise to La Virgen Guadalupe about my virginity. And that's when I, that's how a lot of my process, that's my pretty much what's in my creative processes. A lot of my other ideas come, just they spark um, throughout the day, but that's essentially how I came up with a lot of the work that, I, that you see in the show. When news of the coronavirus hit and the order from local officials to shut down universities was issued, you were in preparation for exhibiting your thesis show. Can you walk us through that experience? Right when the news hit with everything shutting down, everything was can being canceled or postponed, um, I did cry because I was a little, I was, I was obviously bummed out that everything we worked for for three years in grad school and nobody was going to come see it or you just worked so hard. You put so many hours into your studio, into your art making, and that nobody was going to come and see it. That was, that was probably the hardest part for me. Um, so what happened was that I was messaging Rigo in the process of like up until we were going to install. I was like, hey, what, what's the update? What, what's the new, what are we going to, what's going to happen with the show? And he just said, hey, the show's going to continue. And I was like, all right, the show's going on. Let me continue making my artwork because I'm not going to slow down and I'm not going to have a little pity party and be like, oh, boohoo me, blah. No, I wasn't going to do that. I continued doing my uh, my stuff. And then when I think news hit that everything was going to be shut down and essentially that there was rumored on like on a Wednesday that we were going to have, we were going to lose access to our studios. And that was like, um, that was kind of scary because I was like, I still had a lot to do, a lot of work that I needed to work on, a lot of itty bitty things that I needed to still tie and those, a lot of things that I just needed to do for the show. And it sucked because I was like, I'm losing access to my studio. So we, I just packed a little bit on Wednesday. I was like, okay, maybe we're not gonna, maybe we're not gonna be moved out. And then Thursday was, they confirmed that we were moving out. And I was like, Ugh. so moved everything out. I left a lot of my um, finished artwork at school because I didn't have any room in my apartment. 
uh, and then Friday I finish literally mounting the big spice bottle that you see and finish mount. I just literally finished mounting that, and then security came and was like, um, was already knock locking all the doors up, and I was like, my friend Sonia and me were like holding the the big old fiesta bottle. We're like, uh, we're finishing up right now, and I'm like, okay, we're just locking up everything. I'm like, okay, and so we were. I was, I needed the facilities, and that was the hardest part was transitioning from having all these um, studio space and having all the facilities and the print shop and everything was just cut. And I know it was, and I know the school, like Greg, or the, um, the chair tried everything. He, he tried everything. He fought tooth and nail for us to stay in those studios, but obviously he had to follow the rules and like, obviously for our health, he had to leave. So that was very hard transitioning to, from all that studio space to fitting all my, um, my, all my studio practices into my bedroom. How did you manage to get your thesis work up at Presa House, and did you have help? Um, I had a week. Uh, I, we installed on Sunday, and I had my boyfriend and his friend came out to help me out, essentially to move all the big stuff, because I was moving essentially like a whole house, a whole living room, and a whole bedroom into Presa House, so that was very challenging. Um, I had to rent a U-Haul and move everything from my house over, so that was fun. It was a challenge, but we got it done. They um, they helped me a lot moving all that stuff in because I don't think I would have been able to move any of that on my own. And um, so I just told them, like, hey, you guys just help me move it in. I will figure out where I want to put everything out um, the following day. And they helped me out with that. So the following day, um, me and my boyfriend went out once again, and then we started. Uh, that's when we started to install everything. We're like, well, that looks good over here. Maybe we should put that over here and stuff. So, but my boyfriend is a one another 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 person that's a huge support of mine, a support system. Oh my god, I always tell him that he essentially looked. He saw something in my artwork, even in high school, um, that I had something going for me that I didn't understand. Like I was like, I'm making art just to make art. Blah blah blah. I didn't really get it at the time, but he saw something and he's like, keep going, keep going. You got something. You he he believed in me. Um when many others didn't so that helped me a lot he's a big he's one of my big uh he's a big rock of mine and a big support system so he helped me out and stuff so i think this i'm a, so i'm gonna have them help me out again to deinstall um which is probably the easiest part is just taking everything down and moving out so that's the easiest part but then i had my friend sonia come out and help me she's a help she helped me like put Oh, maybe like the smaller things, the smaller details, like this cross looks good over here. No, this this little angel, this little figurine looks good over here. Maybe we should do this. So she's another big um, shout out to her. She's a, like my ride or die when it comes to the uh, comes to anything to do with art. She's a great art friend. Like everyone deserves an art friend like her. So she's a great, great artist, artist herself. So, yeah. Once your work was installed, what did you feel? Once my work was installed in the in the space, I I felt overjoyed and I felt very happy. I just felt a lot of positive like um, feelings because I've worked so hard for a whole year and I imagined the space and I even created a cardboard cutout of the space because I was like I even made like like little paper couches and like little shirts and like all this little cute little things like essentially like a dollhouse I made and I wanted to see this like physically see it in this little cardboard cutout and I moved a lot of it around and even then even with the cardboard cutout it doesn't even look the way I actually really it ended up installing it was just so surreal because I remember asking Regal a year ago back in like February March 2019 that hey I really would love to use this space because um because of the home environment and that this place is a house and I knew what I wanted and I knew that I wanted to install a living room and a bedroom and I knew that it would just be stronger uh, for my work to live in the in the environment it needs to live in versus it being in a big white uh, big white room and like nice tall ceilings like that's not where my work is supposed to live it's not going to come off as strong as it would isn't it than it would in an actual house and so to see my work and actually sit with it was very it was amazing and then like a little bittersweet because 
that meant it was over. <laughs> that meant like grad school was over and it was coming, like it's a chapter in my life that is coming to a close that I didn't never thought I'd ever see it go by so fast. So it was amazing and it was just cool. It was, it was cool to finally be able to shut that imposter syndrome voice, like shut it up for just a couple minutes it was amazing. So that's been awesome. It's been an awesome experience, even though it's been very sort of stressful this past month with everything that's happening. But it was very rewarding to sit with my work and actually take it all in. Does your art represent something about you? Does it represent a message about the world? And does it focus on a piece of history or look to the future? My artwork represents who I, who I was as a kid, a teenager, uh, who I am now as a woman. It does represent, it represents who I am and how, and all the stuff that I went through. And essentially my work is an open diary. Um, a lot of the stuff that you, if you read, um, like the curtains, or if you read my quinceanera dress and stuff, or the TV, the transcript that's going, if you read a lot of that stuff, it essentially is a lot of the, a lot of the writings that I did do in a lot of my diary, um, that I, oh, the journal that I kept. So for me to, for me to be so vulnerable with people has been very hard but very rewarding. So it just, my, my artwork does represent who I, who I was and who I am now as a woman. And essentially the time period that my work uh, lives in is it, it lives now. Um, I am taught, I am critiquing or I am talking about the fact that what's happening now in our culture and what's happened in the past many, many, way before I was even born, all the generations that a lot of these transition, all, the, all these uh, traditions were passed down to. Um, I'm talking about it now and that we have to, that we have to raise our daughters and our sons equally and fairly in the fact that we need to raise them both the same, that cooking and cleaning is for men and women or for boys and girls and that cutting the lawn is for boys and girls. Like it doesn't have to be one way or another. Like we can't favor one gender over the other because one's stronger or one's more feminine and one's more dainty and all this bullshit. Um, we essentially have to start from here on out raising our kids the same because or we have to start now to raising our kids the same because I probably, unfortunately, I probably won't see, obviously machismo is gonna continue happening and it will continue happening if we continue raising our kids the same way we were raised. And that's very, and it sucks because I don't think I will be able to see that. But I, this year, um, I'm gonna become a tia and I'm gonna have a nephew pretty soon. And I really just hope that my sister essentially raises him in a way that is very different than what we heard growing up, that his job is to be outside and for him to be do the, to do the manly, manly jobs and stuff. So I just hope that I can bring essentially my sister raise them different, to raise them differently, and that we're able to actually start here in the next generation, and not in many, many generations out. And fingers crossed, I can be, I will be able to see um, my nephew be treated or treat women fairly and stuff. So I hope that happens, and hopefully, I can see that happen when I am alive and not when I've died, and my ghost is haunting everybody, and like, oh, finally. 20 years later, it's happened to him, but. Why do you choose the materials or mediums instead of others? What techniques do you use? Is there a connection between your process and your artwork's message? The materials that I use is stuff that I remember seeing growing up, like the colchas, the big San Marcos blankets, um, like my blankets that I that you see in the either in the bedroom or on the, uh, on the couch. I know they're not exactly replicas of the San Marcos big or beautiful, like the big fluffy ones, but um, I try to essentially, those two blankets, La Virgen La Lupe, one of the one on the bed, was the very first one that I created and that sparked everything essentially after that. And um, I remember seeing La Virgen La Lupe on the big San Marcos blankets and when I made it, when I, when I essentially dressed myself up like her and I wanted to embody her and I wanted to look like her or to create an image that I wish I would have saw growing up as a as saint owning her body and being in control of that. So that's where everything started. And then like, obviously I saw growing up the Fidel boxes, the spice bottles. Um, I'm trying to think the, the couch with the plastic on it, 
that's what I remember seeing uh, growing up. So I try to use all the materials in in that environment. In all my artwork that you saw in this show, I try to use materials that I was very familiar with growing up. Obviously, the big back, uh, the big, uh, the big TV. I'm from the. I grew up in the '90s and the early 2000s, so I remember that. So a lot of the things I try to make sure I I'm in touch. It's stuff that I remember growing up, and. And I try these new techniques that I learned. I start, I just picked up embroidery last year, and I just I learned like I researched the history and how embroidery was um, is a is a feminist or very feminine trait um, that women do because it's a woman's job. So I picked that up and I wanted to start doing that and I wanted to start working more with my hands because I was so used to doing photography. That's what I majored in in undergrad was photography, and I was used to studying. Um, the environment up and like me posing as somebody else or like putting a wig on and I was the one in control of that but once I took the image I was like okay and then I printed it out but I never actually made things so embroider was my first taste of actually making stuff with my uh, with my hands I have tried painting and I tried drawing and I I'm really bad at it I suck at painting and drawing but um, I wanted to work with my hands um, and I wanted to challenge and push myself the from my last semester of grad school and stuff so that's the reason why I picked up embroidery and that's the reason why I put um, a lot of my video work because I wanted to push photography some more and say how can I create another uh, another thing because I've been wanting to do video for a very long time and finally came up with ideas that did make sense to um, make videos or video commercials and stuff. How does your work comment on current social or political issues? So my work is essentially talking about the fact that I finally have a voice and all this negativity and all these um, dumb traditions and these weird standards that they place on us and that I finally have broken away from all this stuff. So the fact that I have learned to break away and start to talk about what we we should have talked about many years ago, and I know I'm not the only artist doing it right now, um, but for me, I feel like it's taken me a lot to start to talk about these issues that are at hand and stuff. And I know it's not just in our culture that we're dealing with this, it's throughout the world, the fact that women don't get, don't we don't have equal pay, that there's not a lot of women representation in the higher ups, like in the CEOs or any of that stuff. And that we have to work twice as hard to get to what we need to get to. And especially me being a Mexican American woman, I have to still work much more harder to get where I need to get to or even get the recognition and stuff. So. That's where my work is coming from when I could think about talking about issues that are happening right now currently in the world. Who are your biggest influences? Some of my biggest influences has to be, um, ever since I learned about her in undergrad, it has to be Cindy Sherman. Uh, Cindy Sherman, Alex Prazier, uh, Nadia Lee Cohen, um, Jenny Holzer, Barbara Kruger, Musician wise, it probably has to be obviously like um, people like Lana Del Rey. I just became, I've always known about Gina Rivera, but I, for some reason, I don't know why it's taking me so long, but I'm finally like, I'm finally listening to her, uh, listening to her music. Oh my God, beautiful musician. Oh my God, her work is amazing. What she talks about, obviously about women empowerment and um, the fact that she also was, had to deal with a lot of the machismoism and how she had to fight obviously twice as hard just to even break through in the, um, in this men, in the musical, world of men. How do you continue to develop your career as an artist and how do you seek out opportunities? The way I continue doing a lot of my art practice and a lot of my artwork. Um, so right now, obviously, now that I've essentially given birth to this thesis work after given um, after focusing on it for some for like about a year already. I've right I'm right now giving myself a break from art making, but I'm still looking for art opportunities. I'm applying for grants, I'm applying for shows. Even though I know the world is still very hectic, I'm still trying to keep my mind busy and how can I push myself still? What's the next step for my for me as an artist? And where I go to for art opportunities is that I go to um cafe, uh call for entries. That's where I look at Instagram is um it's crazy. The, um I followed a lot of art a lot of artists online and a lot of art um, opportunities and stuff. I cannot remember their names, but I essentially just follow them. And there's a lot of my art friends that usually like they'll post on their um on their Insta snap or their Insta like their Insta story, 
they'll post like, hey, there's this, uh, a call for entry for this um, for this show. There's a call for entry for this one, or there's a grant apl- uh, for this and this. So that's been really cool. Instagram's been a very great way to network with people and look for new art opportunities. What's going on in the art world for me? Um, and then I do have uh, a lot of professors do forward a lot of things to us students. Um, they are the ones that like, hey, I think your show, I think your work will work great for this show. You should apply for this thing, or you need to apply for this. Or I have had, um, I've had had uh, professors like uh, do reach out to other. Um, professors at other universities and stuff and then by that's i've been able to connect like that and spe the spe conference this is a society for photography education i think that's the name um that's another great uh, networking opportunity for photographers and stuff so just talk just me going to these conferences and being able to like immerse myself with other photographers has been amazing um, I didn't even know that world existed until my teacher like we took me to one and it was really amazing to see what other artists are making Besides outside of San Antonio. It's been really really cool to see all that art and just hearing people talk about their artwork or how their processes and stuff so I would really recommend looking for a conference that Has to deal with the medium that you're working with and see how they um See how they connect with the world. That's been a great opportunity uh, SP conferences a studio is an artist sanctuary. Can you describe your studio and your process in this space? Or if you don't have a studio, what's your experience like when you work from home? For me, I have my um, I have my school studio, and unfortunately, obviously, now I'm about to graduate. I'm not gonna um, I'm not gonna have that space anymore. But when I did have when I did have that space before all this crisis happened, I have a I have a book. Essentially, I have a book that I where I clock in and when I clock out. I write when I walk into my studio, I write what time I walked in and as throughout the day, whatever I'm working on, I write down what it is that I worked on that day. And then when I clock out, I write down what, what time I'll leave. And then I will look and be like, and then I add onto that list to see what it was that I did that day. And if I was productive at all, because I want to hold myself accountable because like being an artist is very hard because there's no one there to tell you. You need to continue making, you need to continue working, you need to continue doing this, this, and this. Because as an artist, it's you that has to continue making the work. Because no one there is going to hold your hand and tell you, you need to um, you need to apply for this show. Yeah, they could tell you to apply for it, but they're not going to hold your hand and essentially guide you and make like to make the work and like put the work out there. Like It's your responsibility as an artist to push yourself out there. That's why I feel like artists are their own, their own marketing team, their own press team, their own... Um, their own uh what you call it, average advertising team their own like they're their own team because they have to install the work they have to deinstall the work they have to do everything on their own so i ha- that book for me has held me accountable for a lot of things so that's my practice when it comes to making sure that i am in the studio making so i try to make myself work between 25 to 35 hours a week i try very hard um and if there's and if i don't meet my goal i have i write down not excuses but i write down at the end of the week like Okay, why did I not meet my goal? What was it that was holding me back from the studio? And obviously life does happen. I need to obviously still live at home and like take a break from art. If you were not making art, what profession would you have chosen? If I wasn't making art, I think I'd still be stuck at home and Brian, and I think I'd really honestly still be a cyber manager and just be just really be in a really negative environment and very mean and bitter like I was when I came first came out here in 2017 when I was just very angry at the world I think that's where I would if I was not making art I think honestly that's what I would be doing what does the future hold for you after this exhibit will you continue to work in the medium you're currently working within or are you interested in going a different direction in your creative process all I have planned right now after after um, graduation, well, had planned. I don't know if it's going to be postponed or not. Um, I got into an art residency in Mexico City called Casa Lu, and I'm very excited for it. It's in June, but I think it most likely is going to be postponed with everything that's happening. Um, that right is that that right now is all that I have planned. Um, I want to continue still, obviously, art making, especially now that I have made this amazing show that i never thought i'd be able to create and a lot of little another a lot of ideas that come out of this show um so i want to continue 
working what I'm doing with, uh, but essentially you push it some more. Um, I want to. I would love for the bedroom to be cramped, be to be more intricate, and, and I would love for the pillowcases to be um, more of an art object than just being pillowcases and stuff. There's a lot of ideas that were planted in it that hopefully will continue growing, um, continue in this body of work. I don't want to just stop right now, but I want to. Uh, hopefully in the near future, I will still be continuing my art making and I, and I even I would love to work in some kind of art job related thing. Um, I don't essentially don't care what it is like I would love to work anything to do with arts. I want to work in um, whether whether it's in a museum uh, with kids work, working with kids with art. Um, anything art making as long as I'm just continuing making art. Uh, usually, if we were at Press House Gallery, I would invite the audience to um, ask a question or offer any final comments or remarks. So at this uh, time, um, we'd like to open it up and see if anyone else would like to add any words of advice or encouragement to Gabi. Um, congrats to my ride or die uh, in the art field. Um, We've been together for three years in the graduate program at UTSA, and it's been an adventure, as you know, as I know everything that's happened. Um, but it's great to see everything finally come together in your show. It came out great. Um, it's great to be, it was great to be with you along your journey. And I can't wait to see what else you do. And I can't wait to hopefully be a part of your journey, more journeys of yours in the future. Love you. Congrats again. Congratulations, you did it. I'm so proud of you. I'm really sad I couldn't have been there in person to see your work, but it's incredible, just like you. Um, if I could give you any advice moving forward, it's just to keep asking questions, keep making work, um, and don't be afraid to reach out to people from school and ask people for critiques beyond school and um, just go see as much art as you can in whatever city you end up in and don't forget to talk to your friends like me and Eden and Omar and everybody from school because we love you and we support you. Hi Gabby, congratulations, you did it. Uh, your MFA thesis exhibition was absolutely incredible. I'm so proud of you and I'm sorry that I didn't get to see it in person but I know that it was rock star work because it came from you. And I feel so honored to have been one of your classmates and one of your friends. And I just wanted you to know that after you graduate, this is when the adventure starts and you're gonna have your up days and your down days. And that's all normal, that's part of the game. And just know like when you have those down days that they're they're not the the end and you're gonna you're gonna climb back out of those and continue making amazing work because you are an amazing artist and you're resilient, you are strong, you are a badass, and I am so, so proud of you. And uh, just keep on kicking butt. Congratulations, girl. Love you. Congratulations on your show. And I wanted to tell you that it's been a distinct pleasure to work with you through your time at the MFA at UTSA. And advice, I would say, is just to continue to trust your gut you're incredibly strong as an art maker and a thinker, and you know what direction it's gonna take you and it's gonna be fabulous. Well, we've come to the end of our artist talk. And once again, it's been my honor and pleasure to be here this evening with you and to bring you these amazing stories of these uh, artists. And uh, thank you, Rigo, once again, for giving me the opportunity to moderate these talks with Press House Gallery. For me, it's always fun to get to connect with these artists, especially the young emerging artists who are beginning their career. So much promise, so much to look forward to. And usually when we have artists who are completing um, their MFA shows, uh, I like to offer up some advice. And so Gabi, um, felicidades once again. Uh, I am so proud of all the work that you've done and muchas gracias por haberme dado la oportunidad de conocerte uh, y hacerte muchas preguntas y por compartir tu historia con nosotros. It's 
such an honor and thank you. Um, I'm grateful to have met you and thank you once again for sharing your story with all of us. Um, congratulations on your, on your awards, on all the accolades that you've been receiving. Take it all in. It's all good. Uh, graduation is supposed to be a happy time and it's uh, while it closes one chapter, it's opening another one, a very uh, unknown chapter uh, in the future for you. And my advice to you is to stay strong during these times and continue to work, continue to be you and to share your story of who you are to the world. And don't be afraid of what people might say or the negativity that is always going to be present. Keep that imposter syndrome at bay. We all have gone through it. As an artist, as an educator, I've gone through it. And I still strive to keep that imposter uh, syndrome at bay. Uh, you have so much to look forward to. Um, don't be afraid to step outside of your comfort zone. Continue to learn, continue to grow. And my many felicidades to you and to your family. Uh, I, I hope that these um, moments that you are living, uh, are you're treasuring them. And when you look back, it'll be very interesting um, as a part of your narrative. So thank you so much. Um, congratulations on your MFA show and I wish you all the best. So, adelante. So, I want to thank, um, I want to thank UTSA Art Department and everything that you guys have done for us students and trying to essentially, for Greg, I want to thank um, the UTSA Art Department for from everything, from helping me move out of the studio. And I know that sounds really weird, but essentially just helping us transition into this weird, awkward and uncertainty and stuff that for you guys trying the, your best um to help us out like for for greg and libby and all them and then i want to also thank uh press the house for and janelle for everything they've done for us artists and stuff so um just thank you for letting us show in such an amazing art space and then doing everything that you've done for us um for us artists and thank you so much for listening you guys